Perfect, perfect, perfect. All right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Mornings with Movers. We are here. Cliff looked like he just getting up. Don't make no sense, but it's cool. Um, and we have Steve Jordan in the building today. Um, so we're going to hear his amazing story and um, let him tell us about himself. In the meantime, um, Clifford Starks, the motivational coach over there, um, what's been going on? Join the journey, enjoying the journey. Looking forward to hearing about Steve because I know you bring in the best. So I'm excited. Definitely, definitely. So, Steve, tell us about yourself. Tell us what you do. I think you've just increased the pressure, Clifford. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'd, I've been around the industry, the moving industry, for a very long time now. Um, I used to run a moving company, international moving company. Years ago, I uh, sold it at the back end of the 80s, um, left the industry because I wanted to become a writer. Um, and um, and then I start, I got sort of sucked back into the, the industry and started uh, <clears throat> writing magazines um, for the industry, which in started off with, a, there's an organisation called Omni, uh, and I started working for them. Uh, they had a quarterly magazine, and I started writing that for them back in the middle 90s. Uh, and then, and that I did for 20 years. Uh, the, the, the BAR in the UK, the Trade Association in the UK, they have a magazine called The Removals and Storage, and I edited that for six years, I think it was, six or seven years. And then back in uh, 2011, uh, I started my own magazine, which is called The Mover, and I'm still editing that. That's been going for 13 years now. Nice. Okay. Nice. So um, what what's some content, I guess, go into that article, like, or the magazine? Yeah. Um, Dwight, it's all, um, it, it's aimed at the industry. Uh, it's not aimed at the public. So we're not, I'm not talking to, to your customers. I'm, well, in your case, with a training company, I am. Uh, I'm talking directly <laughs> to your customers. Uh, but, but I'm not talking to the moving public. Um, that's, that's too big a nut to crack for, for, for me. Um, so I'm just talking to the the international moving industry, the movers and relocation companies too. Um, that's the that's what we're looking at. And so all the content is um, it's about it's about the industry. It's about what people in the industry are doing, uh, who's in it, who's moving around, who's changing, uh, new services that companies are putting out, new companies, uh, who's buying who. Um, uh, you know all that kind of thing, but but a lot of it is, and do you know the bits that I really like, the bits that I like best, are where people contribute to the magazine, with not only with their stories about about what they're doing, what the companies are doing, um, but the really fun bit is when they start talking about about what they think, about their ideas, mm -hmm. uh, about the things that they like about the industry the things they dislike about the industry the things that they dislike about uh the trade associations the companies that they work for um the, and also when they have ideas and they want to share ideas or ambitions or fears those kind of things uh, when people write to me and say you know i've been in this business for 20 years and the thing that is really worrying me now is and then they start talking about it yeah, okay. those kinds of things I find absolutely fascinating. Now, have you considered doing like any podcasts or anything like that to make it more like newsy? No, I'll leave that to clever people like you. <laughs> Makes sense. Okay. <laughs> um, so what have you been, I guess, hearing from the UK side of things? Um, well, I, I mean, the, the 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 magazine is published in the UK, but it's not a UK magazine. It's it's uh, it's a global magazine, um, and so we talk about things that are happening elsewhere in the world as much um, as we do about the UK. But I suppose there's more in the magazine about the UK than anywhere else than any other country. Um, but but there is more from outside the UK than there is UK uh, specific. Um, so, you know, I don't focus on the UK particularly. Uh, I'm in the moving industry in the UK uh, uh, after COVID, like everywhere else, went completely bananas. And mm -hmm. um, everybody was, you know, uh, 
they got more more work than they needed than they needed and was you know doing very well last year was was a, a a very tough year but it's been a tough year everywhere so you know i don't i don't think it's any different in the uk than it is in the rest of the world really mm, with so... a, with a few, with a few ob- obvious exceptions i mean places like you know russia and things like that where things are kind of strange right now but yeah uh, but but yeah. Apart from, i think everywhere is more or less the same really have the UK suffered through the housing market? I'm just curious how that works. Uh, the housing market in the UK is very robust. And the, the reason for that is that uh, we have too many people and not enough houses. And and so and so the, the price of housing in the UK is always um, pretty stable. Uh, I mean, it tends to, over time, of course, go up. But even when there's a crisis, it doesn't drop by, by, by very much. Because the 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 always there's always too few houses and too many people, um, so so that's that's never a problem. The, the the problem for the moving industry comes when finance becomes difficult, and, if, okay. and 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 when people have trouble getting finance, which you know has been the case of, uh, recently, or uh, has been less less easy recently. That's when the the number of house transactions drops. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's when the moving companies suffer. Uh, okay. but the housing industry in the UK is always is always very robust. All right. Well, let me ask you, because I've been hearing some rumors about Paris not being as beautiful as it used to be. Which, Paris? Which is, yeah. Who's been telling you that? You know, I've been hearing some stuff that it ain't what it looked like on TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, neither was anywhere else, is it? You know, right. Well, that is very true. Whether, whether it's good or bad, you know, the TV only picks out either the good bits or the really rubbish bits, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Just like Hollywood, you know, people are like, oh, I want to go to Hollywood because of the stars and everything. And then they get on Hollywood Boulevard and like, what is this? Yeah, exactly. And they want, <laughs> they wonder why they bother coming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, Paris is a, is a fabulous city. I mean, I've, I've not been to Paris for a few years now, but uh, uh, Paris is... Um, uh, one of my favourite cities in the world, uh, yeah, without absolutely. doubt. Um, and I, I totally unashamedly say that my favourite city in the world, having done a lot of travelling over many years, uh, is still London. I'm just very, I, I think it's a fabulous, fabulous city. Um, Paris, I think, is wonderful. Uh, New York, I really enjoy. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and you know, I I can ask you the same question about San Francisco because somebody just told me the only last week when I was saying how great San Francisco is. Well, you haven't been there recently, have you? They said so. Maybe some of your listeners can can <laughs> tell me that San Francisco is all right, really. <laughs> oh yeah, no that that whole thing they're having right now with this um, theft thing in California is ridiculous. Where they can't stop you from stealing in, in the stores, they got to let you go and. Um, I just seen a video this morning where a guy stole like 14 iPhones from the store out there and no, and everybody was recording, but they just couldn't stop them. And I'm just like, yeah. where is the world going? <laughs> yes. Well, it's, it, yeah, I, I must say, I've not been to Paris for a while, but um, uh, it's it's a pretty cool place. If you ever get the chance to go, if you've not been, then you should. should be. Okay. Cliff, we out there. Uh, mornings with movers out in Paris. <laughs> I'm down. I'm down. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. What What do you like most about Paris, Steve? Oh, it's just, I, I don't know, really. I mean, it's just a kind of, it's everything, isn't it? I mean, when you, when you go to a, a big city like that, it's the whole, the whole thing. It's the, 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 the architecture, the river, um, the, the, the food, the, the, the history, um, you know, you, you, it, it's not one thing, it, you know, I mean, what do you like about New York? You know, it's it, it's it's everything. It's the whole experience of being there. It's not any one thing. You couldn't, you know. I mean, Central Park's great. You know, um, Battery Wharf is great. It's nice to go to all these. You know, it's nice to go down to Ellis Island and and do these kind of things. But actually, it's the whole package that makes it what right. it is. Uh, and I think the same is true with with. Um, I mean, you look at San Francisco. I mentioned San Francisco. Which is, you know, when I, the last time I was there was probably ten years ago now, and, and it was just great. It's just, um, you know, very bohemian. You know, music on the streets and 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 
you know that that kind of thing uh, sure. and uh, and it's nothing there's nothing you know it's not alcatraz it's not it's it's not it's not any one thing mm-hmm. it's just the whole <laughs> experience that you have of being there and i think that's what you come away with so okay. what well, i guess cliff what's the culture out there in arizona like well, this is coming from a black man's perspective, so I'm sure <laughs> mine is uniquely different from everybody else's. Um, it, I like it myself. There's there's rich areas and very poor areas, so I get to experience what what both sides of those look like, and the richer areas like Scottsdale, uh, certain parts of Phoenix. Uh, very polished, very clean, nice food. Uh, I think everybody's nice if you're if you know how to listen and and really speak to them. But de- definitely different culture from the poorer poor areas than the richer areas for sure. Okay, okay, yeah, New York is just a trap. That's all it is. <laughs> you know, I, I figured I can get away last year and then all of a sudden it pulled me back in. I'm like, God damn, I was almost out. <laughs> I also do love the hikes in Arizona. Nice, nice mountains. Um, then Sedona, one of the most Sedona is one of the most beautiful areas and a very spiritual place. Like when I go out that way, I can literally feel the essence of spiritualism. Nice, nice. Yeah, once I get my pilot license, I'll be flying all over these places. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so we, you know, Steve and I did have a little talk before the show, and um, you were mentioning how the industry sales is, I guess, down or bad or something of that nature. You want to elaborate a little bit more on that, Steve? Yeah, I, I just think, do I? I just think that the um, the the whole industry, um, certainly from my perspective, anyway. Um, for years and years, uh, has suffered with with either very poor or non-existent sales training, and and you know, the, in the states, uh, the states is a more sales orient, oriented kind of environment uh, culture. Um, in the UK, um, and I think some other countries, sales has always had a bit of a a bad name. You know, people apologise for being a salesman. Uh, and you know, I'm not trying to sell you anything. They say, "Yes, you are. Of course, you are. You should be." That's that's what makes the world go round. And if nobody sells anything, everything stops. You should be proud to be a salesman. And yet, it seems that 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 uh, being a salesman is 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 a bad thing to be. And I mean, I was a salesman in the moving industry for 20 years. I I spent 20 years driving my car around the UK, sitting on people's sofas and you know, eating their biscuits and drinking their tea, you know, trying to sell them moving. And I was proud to be that. And and it just doesn't seem to be that way anymore. And and it seems that the 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 people that are that do the training, um and, and you you're in a better position to tell to say than I am, but but people that do the training don't seem to want to provide sales training. Some of the biggest organizations in the world, Feedy, for example, has their own training academy, but they don't really do any 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 sales training. Uh, the BAR in the UK has uh, uh, its own sales, um, its own training wing. And that doesn't really do any sales training, and then and then everybody is complaining that that it's become that the prices are, are being eroded, and that and that they can't get the prices that they want. And it's a race to the bottom. Well, no wonder it's a race to the bottom because the salesmen don't know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And 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 I and I you know I mean I'll, I'll give you an example. And this is an example from a long time ago. But I was years ago before I left the industry. I was doing some work with the trade association, and and we did some research with a university in the UK, and they did some um, uh, telephone research. And they phoned 300 people who were just about to move house. And and one of the questions I asked them is, what is the most important thing for you? And about 30% of those people said that the only thing that mattered was the price, nothing else. 
didn't care about the quality or anything. They just want to get it done, and they want to get it done as cheaply as possible. That was it. That was the only thing that mattered. And then the same university called another 300 people who had just moved. They'd already done it. And they said to them, what was the most important thing? And 35% of those people said the only thing that mattered was the price. Now, the conclusion that I came to from that was that the sales industry for the moving industry in the UK had successfully managed to convince an extra 5% of people that the only thing that mattered was the price. Now, that's not what a salesman is supposed to do. A salesman is supposed to convince you that actually the price isn't important. What matters is the service I'm giving you. Mm -hmm. They've actually done it the other way around. And you, you think about it, the whole industry is built that way. You know, people people will uh, they'll get an inquiry and they will say things like, well, well, I'll come around and give you a quote. Well, maybe they weren't interested in the price. Maybe they wanted to know what the service was about. Maybe they wanted to know what other services you could provide them. Maybe you could transfer their money for them when they moved house. You know, maybe you could um, move their caravan that nobody else has been able to do for them. It might be nothing to do with the price. But the way that we talk about it is we automatically assume that actually the only thing the client wants to know is how much it's going to cost. Well, no wonder that's the conclusion that they come to when we're telling them that that's the only thing that we think matters. Therefore, how can we expect them to think differently? And, yeah. and uh, the, 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 you look at it another way. You know, somebody will say, um, uh, you, you, your, your price is $100 more than mine. Uh, you, you, your price is $100 more than, than somebody else. What can you do for me? And the first thing people think of is, how can I, how can I drop the price by $100? <laughs> no, what you do is you justify why you're $100 better than them. But the industry is totally incapable. Cliff is laughing. I mean, do you recognize that, Cliff? Oh, yeah, big time. Well, there you go. <laughs> and that's what I say. The, 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 the people in this industry are not trained on how to sell properly. And that's why the industry for, since, well, probably since I've been involved in it, which is a very, very long time, has been complaining that the prices that they can get are being eroded. It's because of the salesman. Yeah, no, and that yeah, makes sense. Absolutely. You know, we got I got I seen trucks driving around here with specific words like cheap movers on it. Yeah, you know, absolutely. um, or affordable movers, you yeah. know, and it, it's just ridiculous because some of the things I teach some of my um students, which is other moving company owners, are um know your rates. You know, know what you need to make and know how to sell it. You know, at the end of the day, you shouldn't spend that much time. You shouldn't spend 50, 30 minutes on trying to generate a quote while you're talking to a customer on the phone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I try to teach them as well as my old my old sales staff, hey, how to quote in about five minutes, five to 10 minutes. In the first five to 10 minutes of that call, you should have all the information you need to generate a quote. Mm -hmm. And then now from there is about building rapport with that customer, empathizing and understanding that customer's needs and at the end of the day that customer spent about 30 to 45 minutes just talking to you about whatever they want to talk about and within that first 45 minutes at least the first five to ten of those minutes you already had a quote like okay hey let's just let's just have a conversation yes and i can almost assure you that those customers don't want to go somewhere else and have that same 45 minute conversation with somebody else yeah. And at that and, at, and within that same 45 minutes, you're building you're building value. You know, mm -hmm. you're not just selling them on price. So when you do get them to that that point, maybe 30 minutes into the call, hey, here's what I generated for you. You're talking about does at that point you should have painted the picture of how your service is going to work. Hey, we're going to wrap everything. We're going to make sure everything is protected. Um, you don't have to worry about we'll disassemble your bed and everything for you. Well, hey, here's the price of what we're going to charge. Mm -hmm. They may say, oh, yeah, well, hey, you were. $200 more than the competitor I just got a quote from, but they'll also probably say, hey, I really like what you're you're offering mm. and I'm willing to pay that because it seems like you're willing to take care of my stuff. Mm. Well, that's right. And, and you know, people sometimes will say, you know, so, so uh, can you reduce your price by $200? 
Well, yes, I can. What part of the service would you like me not to do for you? <laughs> right. Take off the check mark. Oh, you don't want us to wrap? Oh, yeah, that's yeah, about Well, it's entirely up to you. you know, but, but no, <laughs> if I could have done it for $200 less, I would have told you that in the first place. You know, yeah. but, but no, they, they, they don't do it. And I'll, t I'll give you another example as well, Dwight, that, that I, I think is very telling. I, I first joined this industry... It seems like another. It seems like another world, but it was 1974. It was August 1974 when I started working in this industry, and and my first job on my first day was to go through. Uh, it was an international moving company I was working for, and we were moving people mainly from the UK to Australia, and uh, and I had to go through the the quotations that the salesman had done to check that the prices were right. And my boss said to me, I want you to go through here. I want you to add up the volume in cubic feet and divide it by the price that has been quoted. And it should be about £2.50 a cubic foot. And if it's not, can you bring it to me so I can have a look at it? Because something's gone wrong. And that was my first job in this industry in August 1974. Now, if you do that same calculation today... Now, I'm a bit out of touch, and things have. And I know in the last couple of years, freight rates and things have gone crazy and, and mm -hmm. have come back again and so on. But, but in normal times, certainly pre COVID, if you'd have done that same calculation, it would probably have worked out at about five or six pounds. So, in other words, it's gone up by maybe twice as much, maybe a little more in 50 years. Now, can you tell me something else? That has only increased by two, by by twice in fifty years, and nothing has. And people say, would say to me, "Oh well, you know, we, we'd like to charge more, but my but our customers won't pay." Well, yes, they will. It's just that you haven't convinced them that they should, mm -hmm. because when when people were paying two pounds fifty a cubic foot, they were they were paying for for that move to Australia, which might have cost them a thousand pounds or something. From the from the from the proceeds of their house sale, and in those days in the UK, you could buy a very nice house for about ten thousand pounds. Now that same house will cost you five hundred thousand mm. pounds. So don't tell me they can't pay it. Of course they can pay it. They can pay it ten times over <laughs> if they wanted to, and if you convince them that they should. But no, people are so. Uh, wrapped up on this price thing that it just won't happen and i know it's more nuanced than that you know i know it's not that easy you know i'm not naive enough to think that it's all to do with that uh, there's a lot going on with it but but a lot in my opinion a lot of the price problems that this, this industry has has been caused by nothing less than bad salesmanship gotcha yeah it, it, this conversation is liberating because when you're using pounds i'm thinking is he talking about pounds as in weight? Or is he, then then I start to realize, no, you're talking about pounds as in um currency. And I'm yeah, like, yes, oh, okay. I'm like, well, it's, yeah. well, it's the same as a dollar now anyway. So it doesn't make much difference. Yeah. <laughs> so no, that is definitely, definitely interesting. Um, and Cliff, I guess on the um American side, what have I guess what have you been noticing? Exactly what he's saying. It's the same everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it don't the change, you're right. The funny thing is I, I've called other moving companies to understand their sales process. There is no sales process. They don't have it. And so, yeah, I mean, you're going to, it, it is going to be a race to the bottom if you don't know how to effectively sell every single time. Yeah. And that's what I've been noticing from the training side as well. As I, as I'm, you know, my whole focus for my company is to, get the sales rep in the door, the new sales rep, whether they have some previous sales experience or they don't and get them from step one to step 10, where they're like, okay, Hey, I know how to, I know how to sell though. I know how to convince the customer to buy into us. And I, I feel like everybody's training somewhat differently and there is really no true process out there, which I feel like there should be a standard because like, I feel like I, with my training, I've been able to train my sales staff to book their first move within the first day or two. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that process work 
But then, you know, when I talk to other people and they're like, oh, well, one, we don't use scripts. Two, we we do it this way. And we sometimes they don't ever tell the um they don't ever tell what they're gonna offer. They just tell the price. Like I've called several moving companies in Florida and they were like, Oh yeah, for that, we can send you two guys at a minimum of two hours at this price. And I'm like, well, you didn't even cube it. You didn't ask me what an inventory I had. You just went off the size of my home, but you really just said, I told you I, was, I have two bedrooms. You told me you'll send me two guys for a two hour minimum. And, the, you know. <laughs> the crazy thing, um, what another thing that I've noticed is uh, people lower the price right away. Like you won't even say anything and they'll lower the pl price. And you look at uh, a savvy, a savvy industry, and you can tell like savvy from a non-savvy, right? Um, but Steve, uh, off of what you were talking about, the fear of sales, it's very interesting. I had a fear of sales when I first started. And my so fear of sales like was I, I got to see a bad salesperson. And when I saw bad sales, I'm like, okay, if that's selling, I don't want any part of it. I don't want to learn it. I don't want to understand it. It started when I was a personal trainer. And then when I really understood what sales was and how, oh, it's about them seeing the value. When they see the value, they're going to pay for it. People pay for valuable things. No, that exactly. Makes, that makes a lot of sense. I, I stopped People at don't a want cheap prices. They just want value for money. That's all. Mm -hmm. yep. I, st I stopped at a mechanic yesterday. I was um, looking at a car um, car shop. And I stopped at a mechanic and the mechanic was like, yeah, well, I'm glad I don't have to do sales. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and I'm just like, well, you're the parts manager or you're the person that talks to customers over the phone about how much their services is. You you do know that's part of sales, right? Because you have to convince them that they they should pay this much to get their car fixed. Oh, well, yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> you know so sales is in everything that people do they as long as you're talking to a customer <laughs> well, my my wife and my kids are selling me on a daily basis we're always selling <laughs> <laughs> it's just the, i guess the negative stigma of people feeling rejected if people don't go with what they're offering and i've had the same thing but new york is regulated for when it comes to moving so you can't just tell people hey here's your price. And then they say, oh, well, that's kind of high. And you'd be like, oh, snap. Well, you know, let me see if I could lower it about $300. No, because the price is the price in New York. And I felt grateful for that. But in Florida, when I opened a location out there, it was like, oh, well, your price is too high. What can you do? And in Florida, people can drop their rates at any point in time, as long as they get the job. And I'm like, I'm not about to drop it to the point where I don't make any money. Because mm. it, it just doesn't make any sense. Mm. Hmm. And because I, people, people are only are only they're only asking you to reduce the price because it, they feel as if they ought to. Mm -hmm. It's not because they can't afford it. It's not because they can't afford to pay the price you ask. It's because the culture that that has been developed says that that if somebody offers you a, a price, you say, "Well, okay, can you do it any cheaper?" Well, why do it? Why why do they have to do it cheaper? You, know, you can afford to pay. That amount of money, and 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 that allows me to do the job properly. What's what's the problem? It's just a, it's just a sort of a, like a gut reaction mm -hmm. that people have. And if you and if you stand up to them and just say, ah, "Sorry, but that's not the way that the world works," then you know, then they realise and they they you know they they, they realise that they actually they've got to pay for something that's worth worthwhile having. Yeah, but, no, that makes sense. But as I say, I, you know, I don't want to oversimplify it because, and I know I am doing, uh, because I know it's complicated. You know, I, I, as I say, I was a salesman for twenty years, and you know, for, for the movie industry, and and I know it's difficult, um, but I just don't think that the industry helps itself very much, and and the the uh, the training that people get leaves an awful lot to be desired. Anyway, that's that's. Yeah, that makes sense. You ask for my thoughts. That's what I think. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. We started when we first started off. I think our rates were like a uh, hundred and fifty dollars an hour, and I was like, um, "Yeah, that was one hundred fifty dollars an hour." So two men in a truck, you know, we were making trying to make it work for those cheap prices. And then I realized quickly that you know, I think my first mindset was, "How can we be the cheapest affordable mover?" 
you know, and I like to use the word affordable because I wanted to try to help as many people as I could. But that race to the bottom wasn't fun, you know, and the amount of headaches you got from like if a claim happened and a customer sofa weight um, cost six hundred dollars. And, you know, at that point, I wasn't too dialed in on the 60 cents per pound. But even then, at the 60 cents per pound, it, you were taking a, a crazy hit on your margins. Mm. And yeah. customers are like, oh, well, you guys ruined my couch. I want a, I want a new couch or I want I want full compensation, $600. And you're like, miss, you only paid $450 or you paid $300. Like, where are we getting this extra $300 from? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. well, your husband helped us carry the sofa through the door and he snagged it, but you blamed it on us and you want conversation. And it's just like, you know, it's all these battles you can't fight because you're not making anything to fight it. You know, and then it was like, you know what? It probably helped me sleep better at night if we were charging what we feel we were worth. And I, and ultimately, that's when the prices started going up, you know? Mm. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I, 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 I look at um the nuances of things and the intentionality of things. And it's like, I always ask myself the question, why? Why is it this way? Like, why are the things the way that they are? And it does take energy. Just uh, Steve, you're you're saying you're you're simplifying it because it does take energy to say, well, well, why are we this valuable? What makes us this valuable? Exactly. What are we What are we doing differently than everybody else? But when you get that, like when you hit it right, and this is as a coach, I got to remind people of the end game. Because if they can't see the end game, they're like, oh, no, I'm just going to do this. Oh, no, this is too hard. I'm I'm good. I'm good with what I got. Mm -hmm. But when there's an end game where, okay, the business wins, the client wins, and everybody wins because we went through this process, because we got our business healthy in the way that it's supposed to be healthy, um, everybody wins. And it's, it's just, it's reminding like Louis Massaro. I know he's, he was the first, the starter of saying, Hey, I'm going to go help other moving company owners. I'm going to support them through this process. And I, I'm excited for the future because as things start, it, it just has to go through the transitions. Every, every industry does the fighting mm -hmm. industry, UFC, we did it boxing. They did it. NFL, NHL, they did it. And every industry has to go through its quote unquote gr growing pains. Mm -hmm. Hey, yeah, everybody, we've, don't forget. We've been, we've, been, we've been growing pains for quite a long time, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, don't forget tomorrow's the Super Bowl, y'all. Um, I don't know who y'all got on y'all radars or who y'all are expecting to win. Um, I'm going with it. the 49ers because it's my wife. <laughs> <laughs> well, she. She plays football, is she? <laughs> <All right. laughs> that's her. That's her team. That's her no, team. You, you guys can, as an Englishman, you, 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 I don't understand American football. Of course, I don't. I wouldn't do, would I? Yeah. But so, can you explain something to me? Can you explain why they call it football when nobody ever kicks it? I can't, <laughs> honestly. Yeah, they, I, I really can't. <laughs> they kick it, but they miss. <laughs> Look. <laughs> all, all, all I can say is we're Americans and we have to complicate things because it's fun time. <laughs> yeah, but no, that's 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 awesome. So, what other um topics, I guess, have come up in your magazines? Oh, Dwight, right. uh, just just everything really. Yeah. The the I mean, what I should say is um, the, the reason I started this magazine was. Not because I thought I would get rich by it, which I didn't, um, and not because um, th there were not other magazines around, because there are. Uh, the reason I did it was because, um, and I'll, I'll get to answer your question in a minute, but I, I just want to put it into context. Mm -hmm. the, 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 there was nothing in the industry, anywhere in the world, as far as I was aware, and still as far as I'm aware now, that is independent. There is nothing that the, the all the magazines that are around uh, for the industry are linked in some way, either to a company because it's their company newsletter, 
Auto Trade Association. So there's the the IAM has has the Portal magazine, the Feedy has the Feedy Focus magazine, um, the Paima has the their Paima report, which actually I I edit, uh, and and LACMA, New, LACMA has the LACMA News and so on. So there are all these different magazines, but they're all linked in some way to some organisation, which means that they are by definition biased because all of those organizations have their own agenda for whatever reason. They all have their own members. And so if people want to say something that doesn't fit with that agenda or might be critical of them, it's not going to get published. And they're certainly not going to publish anything that is sent to them by somebody who isn't one of their own members. They're not going to let anybody advertise in those magazines unless they're members. That's the whole point of being a member. So that, you know, one of the points of being a member, so you can take part in these things. And there was nothing in the industry for everybody else. And so if you were not a member of FIDI, you were not a member of IAM, you were not a you know, part of, of uh, one of these organisations, You not only did you not have the opportunity to advertise your services to the rest of the industry worldwide, you didn't have a voice. You couldn't you couldn't voice your own opinions. Bearing in mind, I started this long before social media was invented, uh, so so there was no there was no um, no voice that, that that you had, no way that you could share your thoughts, and that's why I did it. And therefore, to answer your question, the topics that we come up with are uh, there's a lot of, of the same kind of stuff that you will see anywhere about uh, shipping rates and and you know government policy and all this kind of stuff. But there's also a lot of stuff in there that nobody else will talk about because they don't, because they're, they're because of their own politics. For example, uh, there's one that uh, gained a lot of traction this year, uh, last year rather, um, is I wrote a, a letter, I wrote a, 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 a story about sexual intimidation at business conferences and, and what was happening and still is happening and has probably always happened uh, is is people would go along to to business conferences and there would be you know 500 people there a thousand people there and some of the young women would be really getting a hard time you know particularly at midnight when everybody had, had a drink or two and and you know things were livening up a bit and it was getting a lot, a lot, a long way beyond just banter and have people having fun together. It was getting really serious, and people were using uh, those situations to pressurise people into doing things that they didn't want. And 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 anyway, so I wrote a story all about this, and I interviewed people from uh, all over the world about this. And it, I, I, it caused a bit of a stink in the industry, I might, I may say. Uh, there was an awful lot of people that I think recognised what was going on, and a lot of the organisations recognised that they were not doing everything that they could do to prevent it. And so there's been a lot of changes since that story came out, um, and that kind of thing. And, and nobody else could have written it. Nobody, nobody else in the industry could write that story because they wouldn't. It's too politically charged. Mm -hmm. But I can because it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. The uh, the relocation management companies, for example, um, that that uh, drive the international um, uh, international moving industry really nowadays, they act as middlemen between the corporations and the moving companies and all the other suppliers. The relocation management companies um, were um, uh, not always treating people in. I mean, this is a different, a different, a different subject. I'm not talking about sexual intimidation, but they were not always treating their suppliers perhaps in the way that they should do. And so I was able to write a story exposing a lot of this kind of thing. Well, nobody else could write that because that's where they get all the business from. So they're, they're going to be criticising the people that pay them. Of course, I can write it because they're not paying me. I don't care. <laughs> you know, I, can, I can say anything I like. And, and so there's lots of those kind of stories. And that all comes from the fact that we are independent. 
And it's just, you know, it's, if I think it's something that's worthwhile writing about, I write about it. And there is no politics. You know, I, I, don't, I don't go out to try and upset anybody. But if I do, and if I say something that people don't like, as long as it's true, then I really don't mind. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, okay. No, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. But it sounds like it sounds like I think I was just thinking about Will Smith and the concussion, where he was writing a story about the NFL and the concussions they was having, and they try to like um censor him and didn't want that story to get out. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, most if you got to, if you're working for a big organization, then then there is always politics and that's not a criticism of them that's just a fact of life it, there is always politics um whereas wh wh when it's just me sitting in my garden shed uh then th it doesn't matter there is no politics so i can gotcha. get away with things that other people can't get away with gotcha gotcha all right cliff um take over for a second let me grab my charger absolutely absolutely so with the uh information that you know steve i was actually very very curious uh what is the thing that drives most movers from what you know of absolutely crazy on monday and i'll give you some context around it i'm looking to understand different business sectors and industries so that i can write content appropriately to them and one one person mentioned when you can help solve their biggest problem, their biggest Monday problem, you become a hero in their eyes. Okay. And you presumably already have some ideas of what those problems are. I do. Yeah. Uh, well, I don't know the answer, Cliff. I, I really, I really don't know. Um, what I can tell you, though, is that when I ran a moving company, my biggest mm -hmm. fear on Monday morning was that one of the crews wouldn't turn in. Um, because if that, that seems to be a consistent. Yeah. If that happens, you're in deep doo doo. Um, and, and it's particularly mm -hmm. a problem on Monday morning because you've had the weekend before and the boys go out and have a nice time at the weekend and they wake up on a Monday morning and they don't particularly feel so clever. And they don't really want to be turning out at half past five in the morning to start work at seven. Um, and if you've got a, mm -hmm. a, a four bedroom house that needs moving to Australia that day, uh, then you've got a problem. Uh, particularly if the if the customer is is has got a flight booked from Heathrow Airport that afternoon. Um, you know, so I think that was that was the biggest headache on Monday morning. I'm not sure it was always the biggest headache. But certainly, first thing on a Monday morning, that that would be the thing that I'd be most concerned about on Sunday night. Okay. Um, awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. I'm gonna have to let by carry to you, Steve. Um, you live in you you go in Australia, you in London. You know, these are all places Americans be dreaming about getting to, and they're just like, yeah, one day, one day. <laughs> yeah, but you see, see everywhere, every it's the old saying about the grass being green on the other side, isn't it? I mean, there's. <laughs> There's there's a you know an awful lot of people in the UK that would dearly love to go and, and visit the states who never get the chance. Um, and that is definitely so true. Just like we, some of the Floridians and um, Arizonians over there that don't come to New York because they don't want to deal with this cold weather. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, absolutely come, not. <laughs> there's no there's no such thing there's no such thing as bad weather. Just inappropriate clothing. That's all. Right, I like that saying. <laughs> well, it's true. It doesn't doesn't matter. Just put another coat on, you're fine. It's okay. Like yesterday, I, I spoke to Phil yesterday, and um, he got stuck. I guess got stuck on in the truck today. But um, it was like 58 degrees yesterday, and it was beautiful outside. And you know, to you Arizonians and Floridians, you're like, oh, 58 degrees, that is cold. But I'm outside with, with my long sleeve shirt because I overdressed yesterday. Yes, overdressed for 58 degrees. Mm. <laughs> well, and it go. was beautiful. I tell you, I tell you, there's there's one thing I wanted I wanted to get the chance to talk about, Dwight. If it's if it's all right with you, oh, yeah. is um, just be before we we, we start here. You remember I said that the industry doesn't do PR very well. Mm -hmm. Well, 
this seems to be I my my company was a, a, a PR company, public relations company. And I I don't just work in the in the moving industry, I do lots of other industries too. And the 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 moving industry, as far as I can see, everywhere in the world, doesn't do PR very well. And and I can tell you that um you know, I'm I, I'm inviting anybody anybody that is listening, I'm inviting them to send send their stories to me, uh, to send send them to to me at the at the Mover magazine. The the, the website is themover.co.uk, and all the details are on there. You can send your stories to me if I think they're interesting, and I think the rest of the industry will be interested. I will publish them. It will give them free publicity. It will cost them not a, not a penny. All they've got to do is send me the story. Now I can virtually guarantee, Dwight, that now that I've said that, nobody will respond, and be because they don't seem to quite get it. And and but yet what they will do, however, is they will put all their news on Facebook and LinkedIn and and Instagram and everything else. So they'll, they'll, they will actually produce the material. And they'll put it on social media, but they won't actually send it to me and to other people like me that do this kind of work. Now, you think about it. If you put something on social media to say how good you are or that you've done something good, that's you giving yourself a round of applause, isn't it? Because you've put it on. You've said, you know, aren't I great? I've done this. Mm -hmm. Well, self-congratulation is no real recommendation, I don't think. And also, you, you're then putting it on a platform that we know is full of stuff that may not be true. So how can people necessarily believe that what you're putting on there is true as well? But if you send it to me, and I read it, you know, I've been in the industry a long time, I will know whether it's plausible or not. And if it's not, I will either bin it, or if I think it's particularly interesting, I will come back and say, can you just explain a bit more about this? Because I, it doesn't it isn't quite add up. Because I have to be absolutely certain I'm legally required as a publisher of a magazine to make sure that what I put in that magazine is true. And if it's not true, I stand to lose everything that I own. Everything that I own, including my house and my car and everything. And so I've got to be absolutely sure that what I publish in my magazine is true. And is it not much better to have a third party, i.e. me, saying that I think Dwight is the best guy in, in, in sliced bread rather than Dwight tell, saying that he is? Doesn't it make more sense if somebody else does it? Yeah. And yet the moving industry does not understand that concept, that you go onto LinkedIn, you go onto, social, onto all the social media platforms, and there are moving companies crowing about all the things that they've done and how good they are, all day long. A very, very small fraction of that information ever comes through to me. And that seems to be very weird to me. I, what do you think? I mean, do you, do you recognize that? And, and could, can you tell me why that is? Because I don't understand it. I think it, it, it's about how quickly you can reach your ideal audience. Most mover companies are looking to advertise towards the consumer, They're looking to get business. Stuff. Yeah. So if most of the consumers are going to be on social media, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, they're you know they that's their media. They want to get those leads. They want to get those customers. And I think to go around that to say, well, hey, let me go to a magazine or let me do this in a newsletter, unless it's going to be a repeat business, it, it it's not quick enough for people. And they rather want to go direct to the source than go indirect. Yeah, no, I accept that, which is why uh, we have our own social media platforms and everything that comes to us goes on our social media platforms. So that goes out straight away from me on social media. Okay. So, now, so, you, now you so I, got a, I got a thought. Go ahead, so it, it sounds going a bit yeah, weird. I, sorry, I, I, I was saying I have a thought of why it is and just through my perspective, of course, there's something called cognitive laziness. 
<laughs> and so we're used to doing what we're doing, even if it's not the best thing for us. Mm-hmm. So as a personal trainer, I'll give you an example. Uh, I had people who would take supplements that didn't serve them. And I could prove it didn't serve them. I could show them it didn't serve them. And I could show them what would serve them. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes it was, okay, well, I'm going to finish this batch and then I'm going to go take your supplement. Mm. And it's, it's a consistent, it's a consistent thing in different industries and different processes. Mm. I go, Oh, it's cognitive laziness. So a person would rather do what they know what they're doing instead of attempt to do something different, because at least they know the result that they're getting from what they're doing now. Even, even if it's even the wrong result. Nothing. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I accept what you say, Clifford. I, I, I think you're probably right. The, the, the other thing that people will often say to me as well is how much does it cost to have a story published in your magazine? Well, that's not the way PR works. Editorial is published for nothing. That's the whole point of it. It's published because I think it's a good mm-hmm. story, not because I'm being paid to do it. If I was being paid to do it, there would be no point in publishing it at all. <laughs> would there? Because I'm, I mean, you can't believe it. If if all I'm, yeah. if all I'm, if I'm being paid to publish it all, you can't believe any of it's true. Mm-hmm. But if I'm publishing it because yeah. I think this is interesting and useful to you, then it has to be free. Yeah. And yet, and yet, people it happens to be all the time. Last week, I was at a, I was at a, a conference in Portugal. And people were coming up to me all the time, saying, "saying How much does it cost to 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 put a, a, a to have a story published in your magazine?" And when I told them it was free, they couldn't believe me. But nice. that's the that's the way the industry works. And do you have a page on Facebook, or like a page where you publish all your articles? Uh, yeah, we do. We have we we have the the the, the mover and. Um, uh, Facebook page. We have Facebook. We have LinkedIn. We have um, uh, Twitter or X, as they call it nowadays, um, and um, Instagram. What's the Facebook name called? Oh, heaven knows. I don't know. I don't do it. <laughs> That's somebody else that does it. I, I have somebody else that does that for me. Hey, it's all about delegation when you get to. All, that all I know, Dwight, <laughs> is that it appears there whenever I publish a story. It's up there. So you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know that makes sense. No, that um. So I, I think, think I think it's just I think it's just the mover mag, the, the mover, mover mag. mag. Yeah. Okay, let me I'll, I'll check it out. Um, but no, I think the thing is, um, they used to have entrepreneur magazines, like you know, um, I forget, like basically gives you motivation on seeing like young entrepreneurs coming up, um, talking about their success they had with this business that they created or whatever the case is. And those used to be very popular, but I think it has to be a way where it's ease of use for these people to get access to this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't know if you, you do paper printout or you do online digital magazines now, Mm -hmm. but it's just, it's all digital. Okay. Cause I know it used to be like uh, with Louis Mazzaro, prime example. um, He does, um, like he used to give out book books every month. He'll go go give out a book of a of a certain topic, like this one here, where it says, "Oh, how to crush 2023 or something." Well, I can't see because mm-hmm. obviously I got my back screen on. But mm-hmm. it, it it's like a a magazine where you could basically just read on what's going on in the industry or whatever the case is. And those come to come to our door, or my door, like almost every month simultaneously. And it's like you almost can't help to read it because you don't want to throw it out. So yeah, I that's think, what I yeah. I think if if it was some some script some subscription like that where it's like, hey, coming from maybe the Movers Magazine, check out industry news or whatever the case is or what's trending. Mm-hmm. I think I think that could that could be huge, you know, because it's always it's talking about the mag um the industry as a whole. Mm-hmm. The the way that a lot of people access it is through the app. There's a there's an app for um uh you know an app for Apple and and um, uh, Google and Android. Um, okay, and that's that's just the Mover Magazine. So if you just go to where you get your apps from and just type in the Mover Magazine, then you, you get it. And there's there's no subscription; it's free, and, and it's downloaded straight to your phone. Okay, 
and it's it's and it, it's all it's all designed to fit on the phone, so it's very easy to read, easy to work with. Um, it's 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 a it's a great system. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so um, yeah, no, this this is all interesting. Um, and I know you said you're working on a new article for next month, so we ain't going we ain't going to go into the details of that. But what was your main focus on um last month's article? Uh, there was we had a lot of stuff in there. I mean, to be perfectly honest, uh, do I, I have trouble remembering? Because you remember I said at the beginning that, that that I'm working simultaneously on three different issues, um, and and it's it's hard to because I'm focused now on on the April issue, um, and I've 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 just I've just given the the March issue to the uh, to the designer to work on, and uh, and the February issue has just been released. And so, so people are asking me about the February issue, which I've forgotten about that because I did it a month ago. You know, so <laughs> makes sense. Um, so yeah. No, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Who do you? I guess. Okay, so you write your articles and you delegate. Now, how big is your team, or so like that? Or is it just a one man show kind of thing? No, it's not. There's, there's, um, there's me. We have um, a, a, a lady that handles all the advertising because the whole thing is paid by paid for by advertising. So I have somebody that does that. Um, the the publisher that, that actually owns the magazine, because I don't own it anymore. I, I sold the magazine last year um, so to somebody else. So he he actually publishes it. And there's the designer uh, as well that makes it look pretty. So gotcha. there's a, just a little team of uh, four or five of us. Okay, nice, nice. Uh, all right, so on, on your end, Cliff, um, I guess what um, are you still working with? Um, yeah, Curtis. I am. Yeah. Um, have, have you been seeing an increase? I know Phil's saying that he got he's starting to get hit. Um, not quite yet. Staying really steady. Um I I like the way Curtis's brain works though, because he's always looking for the solution to maintain profitability while the consumer wins. And the employees win. So he, he actually created a new structure with his GM and the rest of the team. And everybody likes it. And everybody wins, too. Okay. Yeah, I think right now is when people should start or should have start building their teams up. Um, and really, I think I, I've been posting some, um, what do you call it, post throughout the week or so like that. Because, like... I was inspired. I was kind of inspired, but tired of kind of like tired of, you know, hearing that like owners are like, well, hey, I got to go on the field today because one of my guys didn't show up. And I'm just like, mm. this is the tired old story that, you know, has been going on for the 10, 10 plus years that I've been in the industry. And yeah. I'm just like, have nobody come up with a solution yet to fix it? You know, and I and I and I felt like I was on that solution within the last year and a half of running my own company where hey, yeah, you pay a little extra, but you have guys on standby. You know, you make sure that, hey, yeah. if you have 20 guys going out for the day, maybe you have 23 guys scheduled because somebody's not going to show up. And, yeah. and, you know, and the worst thing that for me, like we had this company called People Ready, which is a temp service out our way who can give you guys at a drop of a dime because usually guys are waiting at their office just to do general labor work. So you can call them and say, hey, it's eight o'clock. Hey, you got anybody that you could send my way? Um, you know, we're, we're short a guy. But, you know, if you're used to paying your guys about your movers $20 an hour, now you're paying, you're talking about you're paying these people $30 an hour. You know, they're eating at your margins and you're only going to get what you get. Mm -hmm. um, if they damage something, it's on you, not them. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, so it was like, OK, you know what? If, if I'm going to hire people, I'm not going to hire just to hire to fulfill the need that I need to fill for, for now. I'm gonna I'm gonna overhire because employees sad to say can't be trusted to show up every day. So I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna even with what uh what uh Steve was mentioning for Mondays and thank you for that insight too. But that that's a consistent thing is I hope that I hope the guys show up. <laughs> like <laughs> that is the number one thing. I hope the guys show up and I hope the van starts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one, one of the patterns that I've noticed 
and this isn't to speak ill uh, on anyone, but um, most moving company owners, from my perspective, tend to be very blue collar. And so in that blue collar thinking, it's like, I got to do the labor. Like they're coming in thinking they're already doing the labor. So with, with that thought process, it's, it's always more of an internal game than it is an external game. And when you're used to seeing it done a certain way, everybody, even if they don't even know they're doing it consciously, they might be doing it subconsciously say, well, that's the way it's always been done. That's the way we do it. Mm-hmm. And of course, a lot of a lot of moving most moving companies, I would I would say, started from in that way. It start they started as one man bands. So the boss was doing that anyway. You know, yeah. People have often said to me, you know, I've 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 kept my my HGV license going because I know that if if a driver doesn't turn up, I can I can always jump in the truck and drive it myself. Well, that's fine. Uh, nice to know that you can do that, but you don't want to have that as your only fail safe, do you? Exactly. Yep. Makes sense. Yep. All right. So we are at the top of the hour, everyone. Um, Steve, did you want to leave a message for people before we take Oh, off? yeah. Uh, yeah. Book an advert in my magazine quickly, please, before I, be, be, so I can feed the children. All right. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, okay. And I'll post your link as well. Um, and I'll get your, your, your call and tag so people can definitely reach out to you. Um, Cliff, you want to take us home? Yeah, Steve, I knew you were going to crush it. So I'm glad I added the pressure because it was absolutely amazing. Dwight, keep bringing on amazing guests as always. Appreciate you. And audience, I appreciate you for showing up and hope we're providing lots and lots of value to you. And let's have some fun. Let's uh, enjoy celebrating the Super Bowl and ask ourselves the question, why is it called football? Even though we never really kicked the ball. (laughs) Well, like I said, because they be missing. (laughs) But all right, y'all. Y'all take care. Enjoy y'all week. Keep crushing it. Keep focusing on the processes and just keep driving forward. There will be a brighter day at the end of this tunnel. All right, y'all. Take care. Have a good one, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.